Welcome to the Thresholds of Reality, the podcast where we explore unexplained and mysterious events, phenomena, and legends. Today we are joined by Jane Teresa Anderson, author and dream analyst, and also the producer of The Dream Show. And today we're going to get to the bottom of some of Kyle and my uh, deep-seated dream visions <laughs> that come to us, I'm sure. Uh, but mostly we're going to get to know uh, Jane. Strap in as we explore the edges of the unknown. Hit the intro here. Jane, thank you for taking the time today. In fact, it's your tomorrow. <laughs> your, your today is our tomorrow. You're coming to us from Tasmania, right? Yes, that's right. Yes. Hobart, think, capital Hobart of Hobart in Tasmania. Tiny little city. Beautiful place. <laughs> it's and, on the bucket list. Yes. And <laughs> did you, was that place chosen for you or did you choose it? Chose it. Um, I'm from England originally and have lived all over the world, but we came to Australia about 40 years ago. And after the last 26 years of just being too hot and too humid where we were, we just decided to get a cooler climate, which we've got down here in Tasmania because it's close. <laughs> the next stop is Antarctica. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was a very definite choice. Let's just change the climate, going for a climate change and going for a smaller place to live. And it was a perfect decision. I'm really pleased about it. That was four years ago. Haven't regretted it at all. It's been wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> well, one of the things that I've always been fascinated with is dreams and kind of the dream space and the things that happen in dreams. Um, probably one of my personal trajectories and dreams is the idea of flight, how I fly in my dreams. I remember it kind of started very, very uh, laborious. Like it was like a lot of doggy paddling in my dreams to, to try and get into the air. It was very swimming like, you know, very swim like. Um, and then over time, it was more and more like, like pulling on some invisible slingshot and then propelling myself through the air like that. <laughs> um, do, do most people's dreams kind of evolve over time as they grow older? Absolutely. Or, or in the best possible world, everybody's dreams evolve in parallel to us evolving in our personal and spiritual lives. Um, sometimes, of course, we are not really evolving in our waking life. We're going backwards, we're falling down, we're hitting blows before we come up again. So our dreams will always mirror whatever's happening for us in life. So in your beautiful example there, um, there's a sense of in your earlier life, it was almost like, oh, I'm just trying to get something off the ground. or I'm trying to get my wings in life. Or I'm just trying. It's really quite difficult to do. There's quite a lot of resistance that I'm feeling. Might be your own resistance, might be outsiders. And then gradually you, I, I hadn't heard that sling, slingshot version before, but <laughs> gradually you somehow got into the um, idea of a, I can, I can, there's something I can draw on in my life that can actually help me to move forward here. So it's almost like, um, uh, yeah, a, 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 um, a purchase that you could make, not a buying purchase, but a, something to move you forward. And it might be, I don't know, a degree or something like that. Something I can use to really move forward in my life. And then probably if it was your um, evolution of flying dreams or someone else's, you might then reach a point where you're, yeah, I can easily take off because, you know, my life is taking off. The area in my life that I want you to take off is taking off. I feel like I'm flying. I feel like I'm doing really well. Someone else might then think, actually, um, I feel really uncomfortable up here. I think I'm going to fall like I'm going to fall right now. <laughs> and that could then reflect feelings of have I flown too high? How do I, have, I, have I become ungrounded? And so on and so forth. So our dreams, you can look at them as metaphors of uh, what we're going through in life. And yes, with most of us actually um, either evolving in a straight line or evolving a kind of like that, our dreams will follow that similar tra 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 trajectory, <laughs> tongue-tied trajectory at the same time. Yeah. So, so is it kind of like your 
your subconscious trying to to tell you, hey, this the, there you know there's something going on that you need to do, and this is the way we're projecting it to you. Like your sub, um, your own subconscious. Yes, in many ways, it's uh, essentially what you're doing when you're dreaming is that your dreaming mind or your brain is processing your recent experiences, both your conscious experiences and your unconscious experiences. What's going on in the background that you're not really aware of while you're awake, but you are taking in at some level. So your dreaming mind or your dreaming brain are processing that in order, you can think of it as a kind of um, updating your hard drive. <laughs> so the idea is you're supposed to wake in the morning with, all right, I've got it now. I understand what I'm doing, right? Solved a few problems, put a few things together in an ideal world. But often what happens is that while you're processing what was happening for you in the last couple of days, your brain will go, oh yeah, you know, that's like when you were 10, similar feeling, or it was like when you were at university, similar situation. And that's why you'll go back in your dreams and quite often, more often than not, your dreaming mind or your dreaming brain will go, actually, you know what? I'm not really gonna take yesterday's experiences on board that seriously because when I was 10, I learned that. And we always tend to default <laughs> to our earliest earliest memories or earliest experiences so often our dreams can have that conflicting kind of state where we wake up and we didn't really get anywhere or didn't really get anything done or met um, obstacles and it's because we're meeting our earlier conditioning so to return exactly to your question Kyle um, our dreams are really if we can look at our dreams and we learn to cut through the surreal symbolism and madness of what our brain does at night and actually look into our mindset we then get a picture of, oh, that's my mindset here today. That's my programming consciously and unconsciously. Oh, knowing that, I therefore understand why my life is turning out the way it is. I can make some changes here. So rather than the dream giving you the messages, which was your question, Kyle, it's more like you look into the dream and you take the messages from that and then you can make the changes. So for example, Sam, if you your dream was slingshotting you and that was a good thing, you might then think, okay, this is obviously where I'm at at the moment. Maybe I can um, make that slingshot a bit faster, a bit harder. I know what it is, I can work with that. Yes, it, it it's it's kind of these, this kind of uh, trope that kind of follows me, right? But, but one of the things that, that really fascinates me is how vivid dreams were when I was a kid, you know, almost, almost very movie like. And then over time, I don't know if I'm sleeping wrong, I don't know, but <laughs> they've become more and more kind of transitory where I, I, as soon as I wake up, I, I have this vague recollection that I was dreaming, but I can't remember the substance of it. Um, is that a common thing? Yes, it is. And there's a couple of reasons for it. And one thing, particularly in the modern world, is that, and it's not what you described there, but a lot of people will wake up and go, right, I'm awake, what have I got to do? That's my phone, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. And you've missed that window of opportunity for recalling the dream. So some people will have that experience. But I think what you're getting there is when your life experiences are really deeply emotional or you're facing a lot of change, and all those things apply in early childhood. It's like, as a child, wow, everything's like, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> everything's emotional, everything's changed. And your dreams will be on that high technicolor, vivid emotion, wow kind of feeling as well. And as we get older, we kind of get used to things a bit more. And so our dreams tend to be less emotional, less vivid. Although when you do go through periods of change or challenge, you'll probably find that your dreams up level in those departments. So that's part one of it. Part two is what you're also describing, Sam, there is really not remembering the dreams. You may be having more vivid dreams, but you may not be remembering them. And often that's a case of prioritizing it. So the more that you lay there and think, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stress out if I don't remember my dreams, but I'm just gonna give myself five minutes and not expect to remember a whole dream. But if I can remember a little bit, I'll just write it down, even if it's a single word. And that by doing that every morning, you're basically training yourself to recall more and more. And as you do that, you'll get more dream recall coming in. And the other thing is um, that it's, it's sensual. So our dreams, um, most people will dream, of course, in vision, vision um, and in sound. 
And as you pay attention to your dreams, you'll realize that you're, you're often tasting or smelling or touching, feeling texture. So the more that you do that during your day, so instead of being stuck on the computer or whatever, whatever I'm, not, I'm not saying you are, but a person might be stuck on the computer. Instead of that, if you go out and you actually oh, smell things, touch things, listen at a different level to things, um, just open up all your senses, then as soon as you go to sleep, your dreaming mind has that job to process your daily experiences. So it's going to be processing the vivid, the light, the taste, the smell. So you can program the kind of dream experiences you want to have by the experiences you give yourself during the day. Now, I imagine that you must have had some very vivid dreams at an early age to want to devote your whole adult life to. Yes. So how, how, did, you, how did it come to be that you became the dream analyst? Yes, very good question. Yes, I did. I was one of those children that wanted everyone to, you know, be interested in these amazing dreams that I had as a child, and nobody really was. <laughs> but I was very interested, and in that yeah, I had amazing, spectacular dreams, as most children do, and that stayed there and it stayed there, and that that has never changed. But because at university, at, at school, I was encouraged to study science because I showed a few bright sparks in that direction. <laughs> I went to university and, and studied science and then I studied zoology to keep it broad. But then as we had to keep choosing, I narrowed it down to basically um, neurobiology. So mm. I was in that kind of field of the brain and nerves and how we understand the world. But I still worked in as a scientist in that field for quite a while. And then about 30 years ago, <laughs> I just had a week. It was one week, literally, where everybody I talked to seemed to be telling me about a dream. And I kind of reached that point. I was thinking, how can you not know what this dream is about? <laughs> so it drew in my curiosity. And I thought, no, I'm going to go and study this in greater depth. I, I read lots of books. It didn't completely gel with how I was understanding dreams. And so I got a few hundred people together and uh, got them to fill in surveys, to, to write what dreams they were having, to write down what the experiences they were having during the day, their thoughts, their feelings, their issues. I looked at the two, tried to see a relationship between their waking life and their dreaming life, and, um, and got them to do other experiments in their dreams as well. And just because I was very, very fortunate, I happened to be on radio talking about this one day, and, um, and I got a call from... Uh, a journalist who said, I, I think you'd love to talk to my literary agent. And, oh, yeah. And so, like, within six weeks, I had a, a contract with one of the big five publishers to write a book on the research I was doing. And it started from there. So that was 30 years ago. So it started with a passion, with that passion becoming um, being made more aware to me, and then basically just jumping in and going, you know what, this is what I want to do. I'm going to follow this. And then doors basically opening well, wow, that's that's great. So, one of the books that was featured on your website is "101 and uh, One Dream Interpretation Tips." Yes. And well, you said that you've written seven books. I only saw the two. I apologize for that. It's my lack of research, <laughs> I'm sure. But um, where did where did that book kind of fall in? And and can you give us a few? Can you give us some highlights of? Yeah, uh, I start. My first, um, my first book, Sleep on It and Change Your Life, came out in 1994, and that was based on the research I did. The next book was Dream It, Do It, where I looked at, I asked people to tell me a dream that they remember as very significant and what they did as a result of having that dream, and then I interpreted it in retrospect. Um, both those books did really well, but they're so old, they're out of print now, although I do have PDF versions on my site. The third one, um, Shape of Things to Come, was an interesting one because I was being very sensible, the scientist, looking at your dreams, the research, etc. But on the side, I sometimes had dreams that came true, specifically details. And over a period of time, I was um, did a lot of radio and TV in those days. So I began to receive letters because it was the day before the before email, letters from people saying, you know, I have dreams where I see bits of the future and I've don't want, I've never really told anybody because I don't want to be put in a psychiatric institute. <laughs> so many letters like this. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go and do some research into this. So I gathered everybody's um, experiences. 
I designed some research. One was where I won't go into a lot of detail, but where I got a hypnotist to hypnotize me into my future and take notes about what I said was going to happen. And got some very interesting results from that. And all of that, that whole thing was published by Random House as the shape of things to come. So that was kind of like a diversion. Um, after that, I wrote Dream Alchemy, which is um, now has been updated and re-edited as the Dream Handbook. And it's to help people understand the, the kind of common dreams that we all have to understand mm. those. That's still available everywhere. Then I took a little side, strip, side trip. I did 101 Dream Interpretation Tips, the book you mentioned. I published that myself um, because I did that in um, as a, a, a partnership with a, a bedding company who were looking for a gift for their people. So I did it as a gift for them and then also sold it on the side. And I tried in that book to bring it down to the absolute basics. You know, what, how can I bring all this stuff down to 101 neat, small tips? And that was that book. Um, and then the one that I brought out three years ago is complete change altogether, The Bird of Paradise. And I did self-publish that one. And it is really a, a mix of... Uh, um, a, a kind of whimsical memoir of my life, <laughs> but built into that, uh, how to use in your own life, how to look at your dreams, how to interpret synchronicities, how to explore the mysteries of life. So kind of blending of my life and your, the reader's life uh, as, a, as a book. And now I'm taking a completely different journey. I think I've got your slingshot dream thing happening, Sam, because <laughs> over all my life, people have said, well, what would you do if you weren't a dream analyst? And I said, well, I'd probably write a fiction book, but I'm too busy doing all this. So this year, I am now doing a course and I'm halfway through writing a fiction book. I don't know whether it will slingshot into the universe or whether it will tumble to the ground, but it's a book and I'm doing that. <laughs> Is it a lot to do about dreaming? I am purposefully not mentioning dreaming at all. <laughs> this is the first book I'm not going to mention dream, but other exciting and interesting things will come into it, I hope. When you said you, you studied, you had 100 people come, and what were like a lot of the commonalities that everybody had with their dreams? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so many of the dreams did not have... Uh, positive outcomes <laughs> so most dreams and I think we can all relate to that most dreams are this is going this is going oh no it didn't quite work oh no that didn't work I didn't catch the plane I didn't have the ticket there was that feeling of oh, unresolved dream and then the other commonality was whenever they had that unresolved dream it, it was often a recurring either a recurring dream having that exact dream every so often or a recurring theme having a similar dream every so often so that really clued me into being able to see that every time a person with a recurring dream had the dream I could look back at what was happening for them in the one to two days before and always see you know what you've always got this issue or this feeling or this thing going on in your life before this recurring dream so it was a big insight into it's the one to two days before that are key that was the main thing other than that they were all so completely and utterly <laughs> different um, and then when I got them to experiment with uh, trying to imagine a symbol, it was actually a, um, a marble, and trying to imagine them all uh, to take a, wasn't the marble, sorry, that came up in another one, it was a blue star, and got them all to try to really think about a blue star during the day over and over and over again, and just see if it appeared in their dreams. And some people had blue stars, and that, again, showed me what you focus on during the day can come into your dreams. Other people had dreams about, I can't find this blue star. Other, other people had like, total stress dream. There's something I'm supposed to be doing, and I can't do it. <laughs> so once again, it showed me that feeling of it was the task you have or the things you go through in the day or two before that, that are processed in your dream. So that was a commonality as well, that some of their responses to trying to do this experiment. Wow. During your studies, were there any findings that you found particularly surprising about dreams and dreaming? I feel like dreams are still s such a, a mystery to us, uh, or at least to me. Every time I look into a dream or I watch a documentary about dreams, there's a lot of theories about why it arose, but there's not really anything concrete settled or you know maybe i'm wrong maybe that's just you know production to keep us thinking about dreams i don't know but yeah. um and maybe you it's, can shed some light on that yeah it's a very it, it can seem like a very difficult area to get into because 
When we're asleep and dreaming, the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain which is in charge of making sense of things and editing things and keeping things under control and having a kind of ethical stance, that side really is quite out of the picture. It's quite nigh nigh, it's quite asleep. So it's the rest of your brain which is actually producing the drama of this processing. So when we then go about when we're awake to look at the dream and try to use this part of our brain, it's kind of hard because we're looking into this mishmash and symbolic stuff. So it is difficult from that perspective. So what I did find looking at in the research and then over the subsequent now 30 years of working with people individually with their dreams is that every Sing every single, it blows me away every time, every single element of a dream, every single symbol, every single drama does reflect something that was going on consciously or unconsciously in their life. And that has taken me by surprise because a lot of the uh, discussion over the last 30 years, I think people are now understanding more and more that dreams are meaningful and they do reflect what's going on in our lives. I've seen that big shift in the way that people talk about dreams, which is great. Um, but I've yet, I've yet to see there are still there are still a lot of people who say oh yeah but some parts of dreams are meaningless or you can't interpret every single aspect and actually you can particularly if you're working with the client and you're 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 saying to them you know well what what does a watermelon mean in your life when did you when did you last eat watermelon and you sort of explore the watermelon that they had in their dream and and it all starts to connect with all the other parts of the dream so it's um i'm not probably not answering your question very well um but it's that for me it was that the the, the fact that every single thing in a dream can be tracked back to the person's life experiences and therefore to their mindset and therefore, most importantly, to be able to explain why they're experiencing this reality, this waking reality in the way that they are. You experience this in this way because you have your mindset is programmed in this way. Another person might experience this exact same thing in a completely different way because their mindset is different because of their upbringing and experiences. And it's dreams and being able to look into them that, that can help a person understand that. So change your mindset right back to when you were a child sometimes and things change, your perspective of life changes, your, your, un, your understanding of life changes, your experience of life changes. You know, I've noticed in a lot of my dreams that, like, I'm in somewhere, and no matter how hard I try to get out, it's like I'm in, like, this rotating circle. So I go through a door, and now I'm still in the building, but I can I never actually leave. I'm almost, like, going around in circles like I'm stuck. Yes. And so when you, when you have that dream, do you think it might be related to one of two scenarios? One, that you're aware that sometimes you go round and round in circles and seem to get stuck. Um, in your thinking, in your planning, in, in relationships, any area of your life, a sense of going around. And around. But you describe it in a building, so it's a sense of I want to get out. Mm -hmm. So it's a sense of there's something that I want to get out of or um, break out of or move into a bigger kind of perspective, but I feel like I keep going around in circles and I can't find that. So there's that. that's one explanation. Bearing in mind that with a dream, I usually spend an hour with a person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one, one aspect is that you might be consciously aware of that, the other thing that can happen is our dreams are also processing our unconscious. So if you were the kind of person that was brought up in a household where you saw that your parents and everyone around you just seems to go round and round in circles and never really get anywhere in your life, you're probably going to grow up there. You know what? I'm never going to have a life like that. I'm not going to go round and round in circles. I'm going to do this. And, go, da, 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 da. <laughs> right. and so you can be at the extreme and your dream can be processing the fact that somewhere inside of you, there's a mindset that goes, you know what? You're supposed to go round and round in circles and never get anywhere. So it can show you one or the other in relation to your actual life. Does that make sense? Yep, it does. Yeah. And the lovely thing that you can then do, and this is the next step of the work that I do, is it's number one is analyze or interpret the dream. And number two is a process I call dream alchemy, which is a way of when you're awake, reprogramming your mindset for better outcomes. So if we take on the simple basis, let's say you're going round and round in circles, let's say you related that to an area in your life where you're trying to break free, but you're stuck going round in circles. I'd say to you, okay, now that you understand that dream, while you're awake, don't do it now, while you're awake, reimagine that you're back in the dream and there you are in the in the building and you're going round and round in circles and all of a sudden reimagine, oh, there's a door. And you open the door and you go out 
and you do the opposite of the circles, you go a straight line or whatever it is. And you bring into that the sense of going in that visualization to the way or the feeling that you want to achieve if you break out of this in life. And what you're doing is you're programming your unconscious mind using the same symbols that your dream gave you. So your dreaming mind gave you, yep, your life's like that, run around the building. And you're going, you know, if I talk to you in everyday language in English, unconscious mind, you wouldn't understand me. But if I talk to you in your own language, a building and going round and round circles, I'm going to change you. Uh, it can be spectacular. People can, within a couple of days, say, you know what, I suddenly found that I opened a door, I stopped going around in circles, I saw the way out. And people that find it hard to visualize, you can give similar experiences, you can get them to do the same kind of thing in art, or with their body, like literally get up and walk around in circles and and open the door. Um, you can get them to do it in writing and music, all sorts of modalities of basically playing with a dream, but changing the ending of it to suit how you want the reprogramming to be. That's dream alchemy. Ooh, that's dream alchemy. Wow. I like that. That's interesting. My, you know, you as you were, as you were answering my question a couple moments ago, um, I was thinking about my daughter as I drive her to school every day, she'll relate to me the dreams that she had the night before. And it's often just either nonsensical or absurd. Uh, and I have on occasion, not always, on occasion I have said to her, sometimes a dream is just a dream. Uh, and and from what I'm hearing, no, those dreams have meaning and, and uh, we're trying to tell ourselves something. Yes. And it seems like one of the things I've discovered in my own uh, pro professional life is that storytelling is a very powerful thing. Uh, in almost every profession, there's an element of storytelling uh, to be done. Um, whether you're trying to sell something or you're trying to explain something to somebody else or persuade somebody, storytelling becomes very important. Um, is is storytelling part of the dream the dream's life cycle is that what our subconscious mind is trying to do is tell us a story so that we can understand something absolutely i love i love the way that you said that and with with your daughter the best way to is, is to listen to the dreams and always endorse that dreaming is important and isn't it lovely and maybe take a clue from the kind of thing that i gave with carl there if it's a bad dream about how to get out of it um Yes, storytelling. <laughs> Once again, it's I think I think it's part of having that prefrontal cortex turned off, and our natural processing is more in storytelling. I imagine I don't know. I imagine that go back thousands of years <laughs> that we probably experienced life more as stories. We probably explained life. Well, we did, didn't we? Our um, more indigenous societies describe life and the meaning of life in terms of stories. Yeah, gods, monsters myths legends are stories not not psychological um uh, uh sentences and analytical um uh analyses of what's going on in life we we relate to stories so um so yes i totally agree our dream if you look at the dream as a story and this is something i do people often when they start dreams say oh, i had this dream and it was about this is this so i want a dream dictionary and i want to look up what a watermelon means or an egg means or a frame means now you can't do that because dream dictionary our ah, symbols are all personal dream dictionaries throw them out but also <laughs> what i'm saying there is that people tend to focus on i want to know what that symbol means and i say no i will we will work on that symbol it's important but let's first of all look at the storyline let's look at the whole story in Kyle's dream, you know, let's let's bring it down to, I'm in a building, I'm going around in circles, I can't get out, rather than what the symbols are that you meet. Bring it back to the story. When you then say, is there a similar story in your life? Most people will either say, oh yeah, yeah, how, how could, how, that is so obvious, how didn't I see that? Or it can be like the unconscious side, the reverse of the story, which then people will see. The moment we relate to the story, we can change the story, which is what we did there. So yes, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question well, but um, our dreams present in story form. And if we approach them as stories, and if we play with them as stories, and if we look for similar stories in our waking life, that's how we can really use them to our advantage. That is when we then understand, understand ourselves more clearly. We understand 
are the way that we experience life as stories and explain life to ourselves as stories, explain our relationships, our work issues, what our meaningfulness about life. If we can explain them as stories, then we get a, a deeper handle. So looking at dreams as stories is a really good way to go. And the fact that dreams present as stories is, uh, gives us something that probably a lot of other things in our lives don't do. Don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the the one of the main things that that kind of drives me as as far as this podcast is the idea that that storytelling is so powerful because you something about that concrete journey rather than just the abstract idea that results from that journey. Um, makes it embed in our minds and, and in some ways indelibly in our souls um, the, the experience or the lesson to be drawn out of that story. And, you know, a lot of times we find ourselves in conversation with people and, and there's, there's a, a dispute or a disagreement as to what our understanding is. And so, I often find it very helpful to share a story that narrates or that uh, delivers the kind of point that I'm trying to make. And mm -hmm. over the course of that story, the little pearl, the little nugget of wisdom or understanding that I'm trying to deliver, it's like, it's like putting a pill in peanut butter for my dog. You know, it's like, it's so much easier to swallow and, yes. and it's almost like a Trojan horse. You know, now you've got that idea embedded in your mind and you can't get it out. You're, you're going to be wrestling with that for a while. I, I love that. And it does, you're right. It does fit perfectly with the format in which dreams are. So you could have that sense of you wake up in the morning to use your word that the dream story is embedded. It's easier to recall a whole story uh, in the work that you do when you give people a story. They haven't got to remember this bit. Oh, what happened next? Because there is a story. We remember them in chunks. So in the same way, a dream we can start to remember as a chunk because it's a story. Um, so I like I like that idea. Yes, in, in embedding and reflecting our lives, the stories in our dreams. So have you done a lot of things with nightmares? Yes. So, so the, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, it's a little bit semantics. Like a nightmare is a is a dream, but it's a bad dream. And so some people will have a a, a nightmare and wake up a really terrible nightmare. And other people maybe like me, <clears throat> excuse me, might wake up and go. Well, I had a really interesting dream last night <laughs> and described the same dream, but I, I know that not to be afraid of it, you know. But the other thing about nightmares is that in a nightmare, obviously, state the obvious, we usually feel fear or anxiety or stress. And when we do um, dream of fear or anxiety or stress, our body does actually produce the hormones. So you get the adrenaline, the cortisol actually pumps into your body. So you may be dreaming of something really fearful and your whole body, your whole physiological state goes into stress or fear. That will often be enough to wake you up. <gasps> and then you'll remember the dream. And because you woke up at the scary bit, you often weren't there long enough to resolve it and work it out. <laughs> and because you wake up and you feel it in your body, you feel the, the freeze, the heart pumping, mm -hmm. you feel everything, you then think, oh, that wasn't a dream, something actually happened. So you can really kind of get into thinking that a nightmare is something, is, is it in the room? But basically a nightmare is yeah, undeniably scary, particularly for children as well. They need to be helped to understand these things about facing fears in life. Um, but our nightmares are basically coming up when we're either consciously aware of a fear in life or anxiety and we're trying to process it in our dream or it's an unconscious fear or an unconscious stress. And in life, we're like, yeah, no, everything's cool. Everything's fine. Nothing worries me. I'm not anxious. I'm not stressed. But deep down inside, I really am. And it's having a real go at me in my nightmare. Because <laughs> if, I, if I don't address it, if I don't acknowledge that, then my life isn't really going to turn out all calm and peaceful because things are going to go wrong because there's a part of me that is really scared. And that part of me is making me do things that I feel comfortable with rather than things that I maybe need to be courageous with and step out and do. That's a story. <laughs> <laughs> and with, with G, uh, dream, sorry, dream analysis or dream therapy, what is, what is really the goal? Are you trying to help people understand their waking lives or, or trying to have, 
help them have better dreams, maybe a combination of those things. Like what, what's the, the goal for your work with individuals in dream therapy and dream analysis? The, um, the first reason most people will contact me is if they've had a nightmare and that nightmare is, and it's a recurring nightmare and they're not getting enough sleep and they're frightened to go to sleep. So they will contact me and just say, why am I having this nightmare? So the first port of call will often be that, help them to understand what's happening in their dreams, help them to work um, to face those fears, address them and come out of them. So that that's one thing. Uh, other people will contact me the first time because they've maybe listened to a lot of the podcasts and understand that our dreams are reflecting our mindset and that if they can get to the bottom of their mindset, they can make changes in their life. So they are then coming to me wanting to understand themselves, particularly their unconscious, more clearly so that they can make changes in their life. And the so that, that covers like the dream consultation side of it. So um, I'll come to the dream therapy in a minute. So the dream consultation is helping people to understand themselves through their dreams so that they can better understand their lives and make changes if they wish. The other aspect, the dream therapy, is often when people have done a couple of dream consultations and they're saying, okay, I know there's a lot in my life that I'm, I really need to resolve some issues and need to heal some stuff. There's, there's a lot of deep change I need to go through. So they will then book a, a regular, maybe, you know, once a week for 12 weeks, which is like going to therapy once a week. And then in those cases, what I'll do is we'll start with the dream each week. But instead of actually going into every nut and bolt and detail of the dream, instead of that, I'll start with the dream and maybe start like I did with you, Kyle. Sorry to keep up using your um, <laughs> idea. But so, OK, so you've brought this huge, long dream, but I can see in the middle the part of this dream here you feel like you're going round and round in circles and you can't get out let's look at that in your life and so that then opens up the therapy and then we might then bring other bits of the dream and i'm like you know what there was the other symbol in your dream let's go back and get it that throws light on what happened in your life didn't it or this that that throws light. this is how we can resolve these issues this is how we get out of it so the dream therapy is really for people that are willing to go back to look at tough stuff, difficult stuff that has resulted in a mindset that is maybe not working too well for them, that needs healing, that needs insight. Um, and, and so rather than focusing on analyzing every detail, we're focusing on what can we learn from the basic storyline of this dream that relates to your life and help you to move forward. In dream therapy, I do use the dream alchemy, the idea of visualizing or doing artwork or whatever and changing the theme. So. I guess both of those, although they're different, actually come down to, yeah, there are so many ways open to us in life to understand ourselves more deeply. But you know what? Our dreams that come from us, we know, we know, well, we, I wake up in the morning and those dreams uh, happen to me. They're not a therapist telling me about something. We are looking at the thing that comes from you. We're looking at your mindset and we're exploring it together. So there's a sort of... Um, authenticity we're dealing with you literally with your own stuff here and let, let's work through it together and let's see how we can use this to help you to um, experience life in a better way are there any any tropes or or themes that people might look look at as like a warning sign for mm -hmm. need to reach out to you or someone like you for therapy yeah, I think um, on on the one hand, if you're experiencing dreams that are, are scaring you and you're to the extent that you're frightened to go to sleep and you're missing out on sleep, and we all know that sleep is a physiological necessity for us. So, you know, you can become very unwell over, over um, in your life if you're not sleeping well. So that's one thing to look at if your, your dreams are, are stopping you from going to sleep. You might need to look at those dreams. Um, in general, any recurring dream theme, where uh, you wake up intensely um, concerned that you're stuck in the dream or it's unresolved or something needs to happen, um, that can be a point to say, I think I really need to talk to me or someone like me or learn how to do it yourself, um, learn how to explore your dream yourself to get yourself out of whatever it is that you're stuck in. Uh, the other one that I would say is if you have an extreme emotion in a dream, so everybody will relate at some point in their life to having a dream where you are so angry 
like a million times angrier than you could even physically be in your waking life. Like you are screaming, you are throwing people around the room. Everybody has that at some stage. And uh, you are not going to do that in your waking life. That often happens to someone who is so, I'm, I'm never angry. I don't show my anger. I keep it all inside down there. And in my dreams, sometimes it comes out enormously. But those kind of dreams can be worth, um, can be, yes, warning signs. You've got a lot of repressed anger there or whatever other emotion it is. It might be helpful to talk to someone who can help you explore why you're keeping it down there, why you're not wanting to address it because it's going to make a big difference to your life if you can address it. it it will be holding you back in so many areas of your life there's a people often ask and it's embedded in your question there whether our dreams often give you clues about whether you are um, going to be physically sick or ill um, and there isn't really a definite thing i can say about that i can say that if you dream that you've got cancer you probably haven't <laughs> If you dream that you're dying, you're probably not. If you dream that you're dying, it's more likely that you're giving up on something in your life or you're ready to see the end of something because you need to start something new. Um, but I will sometimes see if people, uh, say, for example, if someone's got, um, we, we keep it really simple, if someone's got a slight uh, spinal al misalignment and they're not aware of it, they might have a dream where every time they walk, they're, they're really like everything's heavy on one side. Mm. Um, and although that can also relate to their waking life and there are ways to explore what that means, sometimes I say, say to somebody, look, although we've explored the dream, just check up with a chiropractor or whoever and just see, have you got, is this happening? Because your dream is obviously trying to have a look at this. Now, the dream is more likely to be about an imbalance in their life. And that will also ring totally true. But sometimes there'll just be little bits. I might see um, uh, somebody who dreams a lot of um, choking. And again, I'll say this is probably about something in your life where you're choking on your words or you're in a relationship which is suffocating you or whatever it is. But by the same token, is it worth this person checking out whether they've got sleep apnea? Where they're choking in their sleep. So I'll often give that little aside, but I wouldn't want to alarm anyone and say, you know, if you dream you're choking, or if you dream this, you've got to go and see your doctor. If you dream your teeth are falling out, it really does not mean go and see a dentist. It means <laughs> completely different. I used to have a lot of dreams that I was swallowing spoons. Spoons? Yes. <laughs> spoons, I love that. I, I would wake up going, ah, like I was always trying to like, like my first so, take well, on that my first complete take on it without going into deeply with you would be as as children of course we're spoon fed and you may or may not have had some experiences of being spoon fed <laughs> <laughs> and, and in waking life sometimes maybe when you feel metaphorically spoon fed like someone's trying to shove shove something down my throat or shove some words down my throat there may be that sense of gagging <laughs> so your dream may be maybe going along those lines but i would <laughs> i would have to hear the whole dream but my instant thought was you know our dreams can bring up symbols often from such early stage in life that even if you're not no one is physically shoving a spoon down your throat now anything that gives you that sensation your dreamy mind will go got it got, got a really great symbol for that it's like when you were little and had the spoon in your throat <laughs> i'll have That's to pay hilarious. attention now what's going on in life when i have those kind of dreams yeah <laughs> is that what you do on your podcast though is that do you does that do you tell people how to like kind of work through it what to look for what to yeah i i do a mix um the last this year i'm i'm doing something different just for a little break because i'm writing that fiction book i've actually i'm actually narrating my last book bird of paradise just for just for this year um so that i i can free up that time the podcasting time to write the book we started in 2009, so have been going for a long, long time. And about, I would say 80% of our shows, what we do is we get a, someone puts up their hand somewhere around the world and says, I'd like to be a guest on the show and bring along a dream. So um, they come by their first name only and where they live. And I we make all the arrangement for the setup, but I say to them, whatever you do, don't tell me anything about your dream. I don't want to know about your dream until we start to record the show. Whereas if I do a dream interpretation session with someone by Zoom, I ask them to send me the dream ahead so I've really done some good work on it before we meet. But for the show, we do it this way. So 80% of the dream show, it'll be an hour. 
and I will introduce a guest. Hello, so-and-so, lovely to meet you. Where are you from? What's your dream? They will then tell the dream, and the listener experience is hearing the dream at the same time as I do, and hearing how we talk about the dream and how we interpret it together and how we explore it. And then usually about halfway through, the, the guest will say, yes, this definitely relates to my life. I can see this because, you know, this is happening, this is happening. So the listener experience is that you then move from the dream and seeing how the dream relates to the person's life. And then I will often, if there's time, give a dream alchemy um, exercise at the end to make the change. So that's 70, 80% of the, the shows. Um, in between that, I sometimes do ones where I do exactly, as you said, I give advice, give tips so that people actually get that part of me. Um, I make that easy for myself. I read out some of my blogs. <laughs> so, <laughs> I do that. And then, as I say, just for this year, I'm, I'm narrating Bird of Paradise, which is also giving tips about dream interpretation, just to give myself that, that chunk of time that I can do this fiction writing. Then in November, when the narration is finished, we'll be back to having guests on the show. Did the, did the fiction book you're writing spawn from a dream? No, it's interesting. I I just thought, you know, it really is time that I act on this thing and, and do this thing that I want to do, write this book. So I signed up, I looked at lots of courses, I couldn't find the right thing, and eventually found um, a course online, and it's called um, uh, First Draft Fiction Novel or Screenwriting Course, and it's done over 10 months, so I thought that would be fine. But to do that, you start with a four-week introductory course. I had no idea what my, my title was going to be. So I did the four-week introductory course, lots of interesting exercises. I thought, yeah, that was great. I have no idea what I'm going to write about. But they said, well, when you do the 10-month course, the first exercises will... We'll, we'll get you thinking. But just before that 10 course arrived, I was listening to a podcast. I saw something happen in the garden. I won't say what it was. The two went, whoa, there's an interesting thing. And the whole story went from there. So by the time I started the course, I had my story and I'm now learning the techniques of how to tell it. So it didn't come from a dream, but it did <laughs> come from a mysterious set of uh, situations and a synchronicity so it did come from a, a sense of mystery and the unconscious mind and i'm not i'm not telling anyone even my husband i'm saying i'm not telling anyone what this book is about or even what genre it's about because i want when i've written it to be able to say can you have a look at that and i want you to read it and and have it the whole experience fresh without any preconceived notions and keeping that secret it's really, really hard. <laughs> yeah, <I bet. laughs> That's so great. Well, one of the things that um, we had, we kind of talked about a little bit earlier was the, the tips, the dreaming tips. Um, uh, for people wanting to make the most of their dreams, mm -hmm. uh, you, you talked about making sure you write, write things down. Um, have you ever had any experience with lucid dreaming? Is that something that people should pursue? What about controlling the dream space? Is that something that pe people should pursue? Yes. Or is yeah, it just, well, you know, let it flow? I think you asked two questions. One about tips, which I'll come to afterwards, but we'll go the lucid dreaming one first. Mm -hmm. So for anybody watching or listening in that doesn't know what a lucid dream is, just to define it, a lucid dream is where you're having a, having a normal dream and all of a sudden you go, oh, hang on a minute, this isn't actually happening, this is a dream. This and you manage, instead of waking up, you manage to stay in it. And if you stay in it, you can have that amazing experience of, I know I've got a dreaming reality. I know I've got a waking reality. I don't know which one feels more real. This is mind-blowing. And you can just watch the dream and, and watch it from that perspective. Or you can control the dream. Okay, I know I'm a dream, so I'm going to fly now. I'm going to fly, whatever. So... Um, Yes, of course, I've had lucid dreams. I'm not a good lucid dreamer. I call myself a failed lucid dreamer. For example, I, I once dreamed I was on, on, on top of a double-decker bus um, giving a lecture about lucid dreaming. And when I record the dream, it was actually quite good. It wasn't a daft lecture. It actually had a lot of good points in it. And at no point did I realize that I was, I was dreaming, <laughs> even though I gave the lecture. I will often have a dream where someone will say to me, do you think you're dreaming? And I go, no, no, no way. And they go, well test it and I go well I'll, if it's a dream I'll be able to fly and I'll pathetically do something like this and not fly and wake up and go it was a dream 
On the other hand, there'd be some dreams where I go, oh, wow, yes, it's a dream, I'm lucid. So I do lucid dream, but I'm not very, I'm not very good at it. And I think one of the reasons is, and answering your question, now that you know that dreams are important in processing our waking life experiences to update our mindset, to help us deal with the world in better ways, if you start to control the dream, you're stopping your natural dreaming process, which you actually need for your health, for your emotional health and your physiological health and your mental health. So every time you do cut in with a lucid dream and take control of it, you're, you're stopping that process. So my advice would be if people love to have a lucid dream and control it, yeah, do it a couple of times a week, but don't do it more than that. If you find yourself lucid, take a back seat, enjoy the experience, but don't change the dream. Go for the added benefit of either um, I can remember this in great detail, or although I said don't change the dream, if, if it's a recurring dream and you're working on a dream alchemy practice, working on that visualization of getting out, and you're suddenly in that dream and you're lucid, do it there, do it in that space. Um, regarding dream, I, for me, the most exciting thing about lucid dreaming isn't so much controlling it and doing amazing things, but this is just me. The exciting thing is the equality of the realities. So I think if I, I can see my waking life reality, I can see my dreaming re life reality, and they both seem to have equal value. So this tells me that there may be a third or a fourth or a fifth reality where if I entered it, it would also have equal value. It changes my opinion about how real <laughs> in inverted commas my waking life is. In, reg in regards to dream interpretation tips, I mean, if you want to go the whole way, I do have online courses that people can do in their own time on, on, on my website. But I would usually go for two main tips. One is to stand, stand a long way back from the whole dream, even if it's a really long, complicated dream, and summarize it in one simple sentence. So let's imagine it's your dream again, Kyle. And let's imagine all sorts of amazing things happen in your dream, like it's a whole fiction novel of its own, but every now and then you're running around in circles. You might say, you know, of this whole huge dream that I have, the one thing that really sticks in my mind is, I'm just going round and round in circles. So my one sentence would be, in this dream, whatever happens, I end up going round in circles and I can't get out. Or um, someone else might have this amazing dream, but whatever happens, I I'm, I'm just always trying to get to the airport. You know, in chapter one, I'm trying to get to the airport and this happens. In chapter two, I'm trying to get to the airport and this happens. In chapter three, and all this amazing storyline of my dream, but the bottom line is I'm trying to get to the airport What's your simple sentence about your dream? It's not I'm trying to get to the airport. It's I'm trying to get somewhere. You keep it vague. I'm trying to get somewhere and I'm not getting there. So summarize your uh, dream as a simple sentence and look for that situation in your waking life. That's kind of like step one of exploring your dream. There are lots of other tips, but that's kind of like the one that it's really good to get across. And also this idea of look for the the metaphor, look for the story, look for the corresponding story in your waking life. And that begins to orientate you about that's what your dream means. Yeah. Oh, wow. Now I'm <laughs> reviewing in my mind many past dreams that I, I, I was able to remember. And in fact, they were, they were inspirations for stories that I've written. And, um, one of them in particular, well, you know, the, the thing about it is, is that they're very weird. I, one of our viewers posted this. He wanted, <laughs> I was waiting for the right moment. It seems like now is the right time. Uh, but he says, can you tell me what this may mean? I had a dream the other night that Scrooge McDuck was attacking me with vines inside a haunted house. And and like you like you're saying, you know, take it down to, you know, take the details out, maybe look at it in a general sense. Something is attacking him in a scary place. Yes, exactly. So you start with that. Some, I feel like I'm being attacked. Where do you feel that in waking life? And then we would go to say, I've already forgotten his name because it's off, off screen, Scrooge McDuck, whatever it is. Yeah, <laughs> Scrooge McDuck. What does Scrooge McDuck mean to you? What's the personality of Scrooge McDuck? And you'd really kind of drill down on, on why his dreaming mind might have said, Scrooge McDuck's a good example of this. So he, I don't know who Scrooge McDuck, McDuck is, but, you know, if he might say, um, oh, he's a... Uh, what, can you? Can either of you help me out? What's Scrooge, Scrooge, McDuck? Mac, Scrooge McDuck is a a wealthy cartoon character. Uh, he's famous because he swims in his money all the time. He can swim through. Okay, his money. 
Right. So it, the, the person who posted about that dream may have a different opinion of Scrooge McDuck, but let's say that he thinks of someone that's extremely wealthy. Then you said, okay, so you are feeling attacked by a sense of wealth, a sense of wealth or entitlement to wealth. You're feeling attacked by that. And that would start to be meaningful for that person. There's vines in the house. So you'd say to him, well, how were the vines were being used? Were they being used to strangle you? Were they being used to swing from A to B? So you're trying to see what, what, what's happening here, what, what's happening. The sense the horse, the moment the house is haunted, you're probably looking at the sense of, um, I'm going to say ghost, but I don't mean a real ghost. We often dream of a haunted house in our life when we are haunted by something. So the other one simple sentence take, the one you did was correct. But you could also be, um, I feel like I'm I'm being haunted by Scrooge McDuck in a haunted house. <laughs> so we, we all have sense in our life when we're, we're haunted by our past. We're haunted by our experiences. And those past experiences are stopping us from doing things or are, are making us respond in different ways because we're haunted by what we've done in the past or our past. So I'd say then, again, we normally spend an hour looking at a dream and interact with the person. But in that dream, I'd say there may be a financial issue that is haunting him and a sense of somewhere in waking life of somebody either um, uh, promoting the entitlement to wealth and it's like really getting at me because, you know, maybe I can't get that wealthy state that I want or someone who does seem to be entitled around wealth is uh, is uh, threatening him in some way. So we would go down those avenues. But yes, you're right. One simple sentence, I'm feeling attacked. Another simple sentence, I'm feeling haunted in some way. Put those two together. Fascinating. Yes. Wow. <laughs> uh, I I think that this is a, a very fascinating. I think when I when I when Kyle and I were conceiving of the idea of thresholds of reality, this was one of the topics that that I had on my my must have list. And I'm glad that we had the chance to talk to you today. Um, I do want to. Direct everybody, your website is janetheresa.com. Is that right? That's right. Teresa without an H for those that are only listening. <laughs> okay. I'm going to see if I can share the website here. And where can they find your, what's your podcast called? Where, uh, where Thank can they you. Find that? It's called The Dream Show with Jane Teresa Anderson. And it's on all the usual places, you know, mm -hmm. Apple, Spotify, etc. So, yes, that's. That's janetheresa.com that you're screening now. So I write, a, you're going down there, the blog role. I, I write a, a blog. For, I have two websites. This is one of them. I write a blog for each website um, every month alternately. And um, as you, that's, for those, for those who are watching on the visual, that was all my books. Yeah. And you can see there's links there to all sorts of things, including the podcast show and including the courses and the courses are on, a, are on my learning platform. Very good. Yeah, we've got courses right here. Dream yeah. interpretation, dream alchemy, dream therapy level one, dream therapy level two, the dream academy yeah. online. So the first, the first, I won't go through them all, but just the first one, which is what people listening to this might be most interested in, is called how to interpret your dreams step by step. So I take people literally through, they print out a PDF chart and I take them through, you take a dream and you answer my questions as you go through, you look at your dream and you answer my questions, put them on your chart and it takes you through the step-by-step -step procedure of understanding one dream. And then of course you can bring another dream through the system again and again and again. And eventually you, you learn how to do that without following the steps. So that's the first one, how to interpret your dream step-by-step. And uh, I don't do any live component. The videos are all pre-recorded and all the information's there so people, so that people can do it in whatever time zone you're in, um, in your own time, in your own space, no hurry, no worry. Well, That's great. thank you so much for joining us today. I found the topic absolutely fascinating. And uh, to all our viewers, all our listeners, please check out janetheresa.com for all of this wonderful, uh, all these wonderful resources uh, regarding dream interpretation and check out the dream show that has been on for now over a decade, right? You said 13 years. Yeah, <laughs> wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. You got some real longevity there. Um, yes. 
And for anybody, for our listeners, uh, if you like this content and you want to see more of it, please make sure that you like, that you comment or subscribe. We appreciate all of our live viewers for tuning in and sharing your comments and questions. Brian, hopefully we can get to the bottom of your Scrooge McDuck <laughs> fantasies. <laughs> Thank you and for having me on the show. It's really lovely to talk with you both. I appreciate it. And until next time, keep on exploring the edges of the unknown.